All right. Well, thank you very much for that extremely kind introduction. Um, I'm Cynthia Matuzic. And today I'm going to talk about a variety of different topics. There's several different themes that I'm going to try to tie together into a coherent talk. Um, today I'm going to talk about learning language and simulation for real robot interaction and how work in this area touches on a lot of different spaces in AI. So in this talk, I'm going to talk about building robots that use grounded language to interact with people. It's important that robots that go in human-centric spaces be able to interact adaptably, but flexible is one thing that our current robots aren't. We're still really bad at novel or dynamic needs or situations. And my goal is to have robots that can depend on instructions and information from the people around them to overcome that. As you'd imagine, this is a pretty multidisciplinary approach because it needs robots, natural language, and human interaction. And since the goal is specifically for robots to deal with dynamic environments, it also requires learning. Um, there's a lot to say in this space, but in the talk, I'm going to touch on three high-level topics. Um, treating language grounding as a shared embedding problem, how important actual speech is in our robot interactions, and how we're starting to address some of the data problems by using learning from simulation. Here, we're considering and testing grounded language as an interactive collaborative problem. That is, we claim that a robot understands language if it does what a user intends when a user is giving instructions. And we focus on the language part of HRI because it has a lot of advantages for human robot interaction. It's concise, it's intuitive, it's pre-existing for human interactors. And of course, it's adaptable to a wide variety of situations. And when I say grounded language here, I'm talking about language that refers to and has meaning in the context of the physical world around the robot, which is not the only way that people use that term. So this combination of fields has a lot of value. Human interaction with robots is a lot more feasible if they can use language and understanding language about the world almost requires access to that world in the form of physical perceptual data. So given a situation where we have some set of symbols or some speech act that we're trying to understand, that's not an easy problem. So if you look at this, the robot, if the robot is trying to figure out between two relatively similar sounding push up or shut up instructions, it's just not obvious what to do. But once you add some context in the form of sensor data, it becomes much more obvious what's going on because this is the world that language applies to. That's what these, sim that's what these symbols ground out in. And what makes language grounded is the idea that instead of language being learned by careful programming or from textual context, we can learn it from actual interaction with the world. So, I mean, you don't learn what an apple is by reading about it in a dictionary. You learn what an apple is by picking it up, moving it around, rotating it in front of your sensors, interacting with it in the real world. And in many ways, what we're talking about here is the classic symbol grounding problem. How do you take symbols and find out what they really mean in a computational and non-computational sense. This is the core problem that I try to address in my work. This is made somewhat more difficult by the fact that our subdisciplines all mean slightly different things by that. Particularly, we mean different things by the idea of what real context is. Um, for natural language people, context tends to mean the words around the words of, that we are interested in. In vision, it means referring to or retrieving images with language. In robotics, when we say, uh, when we say grounded language context, we're talking about the literal real world in which the language occurs and to which it refers. Um, but it's still the case that natural language and robotics and vision rely on one another and rely on machine learning to solve the problem. And just to define that task a little more clearly, the idea is that we want to learn new language about new concepts from interactions that are associated with language and grounded in percepts. So given some novel language that we haven't encountered before, we want to form hypotheses about how that language refers to things in the world and then use the physical context, that is the world state, to disambiguate among those possible hypotheses. So the core of what we're doing here is learning across multiple data streams using each source of data as a source of inductive bias for the others. So conceptually, what we're trying to do here is learn a language model that parses from natural language to some expression of semantics, 
And those semantics can be explicit or implicit. And, and also a perceptual model where terms in the formal expression denote the identification of objects or actions. Given the output of those models, we can treat the semantic expression as a query against the perceived world state that denotes particular things in that world state. So all of these elements are either inputs or components of the learned system. And just to formalize the problem a little further, what we're trying to do is compute the probability of an indicated set G, which is conditioned on the natural language sentence X in the perceived world state O. And we do this by summing over two latent structures, Z, which is the semantics derived from X, and W, which is the probability of a world that is just the product of the probabilities of individual identifications for things in the world. And this gives us a final joint model for selecting the named objects G. So the models are trained independently, but then we specify a joint probability by coupling them with this final term, which is a conditional probability term that holds the first two in agreement. That is by observing G, which is the actual ground truth, the actual things that language refers to, um, a dependency between Z and W is induced. And again, this can be treated as an explicit learning target, but what I'm really doing here is defining the grounded language problem. And from here, I'm going to talk about a number of different ways to tackle solving it. And I meant to say, by the way, that I'm, I'm happy to be interrupted with questions partway through if anybody has anything they'd like to bring up. So one of the things to note here is that language grounding is a multifaceted problem. No one thing is going to be the silver bullet for solving language grounding. So a variety of approaches are critical for solving different pieces of it. And that includes deep learning, but it also includes geometric methods and information theoretic approaches. And I'll talk briefly about some recent papers that tackle a subset of these problems. Then I'll come back around to simulation. One way to think about grounded language is that it's sort of a shared embedding problem. Um, in that sense, uh, language and percepts or sensory inputs both refer to some real thing in the world. And that real thing may be an object or a type of action, or it may be a complete task, but it's something that is mediated for a person by the language that they're using. And it's mediated for the robot by its senses, its sensing of the world. That conceptualization is useful because we know a lot about different ways of discovering or using shared embeddings. So I'm going to give a couple of examples of this shared embedding viewpoint. And the first one is finding semantically meaningful negative examples from language that hasn't been grounded yet. I've been describing this work so far in terms of machine learning problems, but in general, those methods need negative as well as positive examples. And I'm excluding positive unlabeled learning here, um, but in general, that data is hard to get because without prompting people, it's very rare if you ask people to describe things, they don't tend to hold up a pen and say, this isn't a carrot. Um, that's just not the kind of data that you get. And you can't take the fact that something was not labeled in some way as a sign that it is not a member of a particular class. So if somebody describes an object and says, this is a lemon, you can't conclude from that description that it's not yellow because language is not exhaustive. Um, you can't assume that every label that is meaningful is going to be provided for every object. And we tackle this by encoding descriptions of objects as paragraph vectors, which is a formalism that tries to encode semantically similar documents as similar vectors. That is semantically similar documents appear or are physically close together in some vector space. And this way we can analyze the vector relationships using any vector distance metric as a measure of object similarity. And we can do that even though we don't actually know the semantics of any words in the descriptions yet or what they mean in terms of the physical world. And once we do that, we can take the objects with a large cosine distance, for example, as a possible distance metric as negative examples for a term. So here, if the object that we're trying to learn a grounding for is this banana shown here, shown at the top, then choosing a red semicylinder is as a thing that is most unlike banana as negative data for the learning problem. And we can do that purely by analyzing the language before we've connected the semantics to the world. 
And just to provide some intuition as to how that works, it works pretty well. And it generally does a good job finding a variety of negative examples for concepts we're trying to learn. So here we've got some things, that, some labels that were actually collected and the objects that those labels refer to, and some negative examples that were chosen as negatives for learning what that particular term means. And here, these negative examples were, again, chosen based entirely on their descriptions. There's no visual input because that's the problem that we're trying to solve. Um, and these results hold regardless of whether we pull negatives from the most distant objects or from closer kind of near miss objects, as long as a certain minimum distance threshold is observed. Yes. Yes. Uh, yes. So, you, from the so, um, so the vector paragraphs is actually a thing that learns an embedding of sentences okay. into a vector space based on the similarity of those sentences. So there's a background semantics in the actual word to vec approach where if we take what we're taking is a document that consists of all the descriptions of a particular object and embedding that in the vector space, describing the semantics of that document. And then we do that here. I think this may be the more relevant slide. And we do that for all of the objects in our data set. And then we're able to look at that vector space and say, uh, these objects are close to one another. These, the documents for these objects are close to one another, given this paragraph vector embedding that tries to capture semantics. So we don't know what the words mean yet. And we certainly don't want know what they mean in terms of the objects that they describe, but we know that some of them are like others and some of them are farther away from others. The idea is that if, if things that have a semantic similarity are supposed to be, uh, are, are supposed to be uh, vector similar. So the key example of this that everybody always gives is the idea that if you take king and queen, um, they should be near to one another in vector space. But if you take something like the king vector and subtract the man vector, you should get the queen vector. So the idea is that each of the, is that the semantics of these are captured in a way where you can use the actual vector embedding to calculate relationships among them. Sure. Uh, I want to understand how one gets the distinguish between performances and semantics. So, in the example that, uh, uh, in the example that you gave, uh, king and queen are mm -hmm. concepts that were learned by word to vec or mm -hmm. something similar like this yes. across many uh, examples. Uh, examples. Yes. But for bananas and apples, uh, someone somewhere ate a banana. He said it, it looks good or it tastes good. Mm -hmm. uh, so the word to vec embedding was trained on both affordances and semantics, mm -hmm. whereas for concepts that are not objects in the physical world, you only have semantics, thoughts, mm -hmm. uh, uh, stuff. So how, if uh, if I get the drift of where you're going, you would like to now plug in affordances using the semantics. I could be wrong, but how do you distinguish between the two? Well, so for this purpose, you don't actually have to. Um, you don't actually have to differentiate between semantics and affordances because the question is how similar are these objects in terms of, and paragraph vectors are actually a paragraph to vec form. Um, so it's actually taking advantage of some of the structure of the, of the sentences, not just individual words. Um, but you, if, if you've got two objects that are described as this is tasty to eat, for example, uh, then the chances are that they're still similar in some semantically meaningful sense, such that you can say, you know, a set of things that are described as tasty to eat maybe are better positive examples for one another or more similar to one another than a set of things that are described as easy to write with. So the affordances are part of the semantics if what you're trying to do is just figure out uh, similarity. Yeah, thank you. Does that answer the question? Uh, I'll expand on it maybe later. Okay. Okay. <laughs>
So Rosina asks, in your formulation, you're not considering the image formation influence. The color blue or red or other can have very different spectral distribution depending on the illumination. Mm -hmm. The semantic label of the color must include this, yes or no? Uh, the semantics may just does not necessarily need to include, well, so the problem is that that sort of spectral distribution is exactly what we're trying to learn, right? We're trying to learn what the words blue or red actually mean. And what we're trying to do for this piece of the work is just find things that are, dis the right way to think of it is we're trying to find things that are described similarly to one another and described dissimilarly to one another. So as long as blue and red are described dissimilarly, as long as people don't use the same words and the same sentence structures to describe them, um, then they end up separated out in this distance space. And then, and only then, you can use the fact that they are separated out. So this, this may now be the more relevant slide. Um, you can use the fact that they are separated out to collect negative examples. And then you can use it to learn to understand what the, the individual terms really mean for the physical objects, for the physical grounding of the terms. Does that make sense? Uh, a more basic question, I guess, is um, so you have a sentence that that you know, like you, if you're if you have a bunch of semi cylinders and some are red and some are blue, you will mm -hmm. find like almost identical sentences that only yes. switch out red and blue. How does that? Well, it's an n-dimensional space, right? So what you'll end up with is things that are have this isn't exactly right, but things that have like a semi cylinder axis where vectors are clustered, but also a color axis where they're spread out, right? So this is, this is a high dimensional space with room for lots of, these things are similar in one way and dissimilar in another. And cosine distance or Euclidean distance gives the ability to ask just sort of how, how nearby are these things in a general sense. So a red cylinder and a blue cylinder would hopefully be closer together than a red cylinder and a carrot, for example. Um, but still farther apart than two red cylinders. Got it. Thanks. Oops. And the results of doing this indicate that this approach to finding negative examples when we're trying to learn language groundings results in more effective learning than the typical baselines for grounded language learning which are to either take all non-positively labeled objects as negative examples or to randomly select non-positively labeled objects as, as negative examples. Um, and that's, this, is, you know, this is sort of my first example of treating language grounding as one in, in which semantics are a property of the shared non-observable embedding between modalities. And we have found that using this negative example selection consistently improves our grounded language learning through a variety of other learning tasks, some of which I'm going to talk about. The second example that I want to give is different in that rather than just relying on the existence of the shared embedding, it involves learning to approximate it directly. And one way of handling shared embeddings is called manifold alignment where featureized language and sensor data are treated as projections of some underlying manifold and non-observable space. So the goal is to find functions that approximate that manifold. And this can be done in a variety of ways. It can be done using deep learning methods, but it can also be considered as a geometric analysis problem. So what that means is that you can learn alignments between heterogeneous data sources where you're learning a projection of data to an embedding space where intra-class distances are smaller than inter-class distances. And while you can use deep metric learning to learn those projections, our intention is that the learned metric and embedding capture the semantics of the paired data. We want to use data from heterogeneous domains to learn metric embeddings. So for example, in language, if somebody refers to something as a tomato while gesturing to it so that a robot knows to direct sensors to it, 
And more specifically, we want to learn two or more embedding alignment functions that map sensor inputs and language data respectively to a shared representation. And we do this using triplet loss, which is a function that directly encodes the idea that samples from a common class should be closer together in some shared embedding, while samples from separate classes should be farther apart. So here we're learning the functions f sub v and f sub l that map percepts and language to a shared higher dimensional space. And specifically triplet loss tries to minimize the distance between an anchor point, which here is the perceptual inputs of an object and an associated sample in another modality, which is here the language describing that object. But at the same time, maximize the distance between the anchor point and a negative point in the other modality, such as the description of an unrelated thing. And all of the examples of language in this talk were pulled from data sets for actual language grounding that we've collected from people. So they're all real examples of languages, language and objects. The learned embedding should then hopefully look something like this, where language is in the shared visual linguistic embedding is near the things that it describes and far from other things. And that approach works not only in producing uh, embeddings that can be visualized and show substantial overlap. So here on the top, I've plotted vision and language for 10 randomly selected classes. And you can see that the individual classes sort of appear in the same, the same areas of the embedding space, but also in performance on a series of object selection tasks based on a robot following instructions about collecting objects. So here using triplet loss methods, which is the orange and blue lines, substantially outperforms deep CCA approaches that we tested. And of course there are places where things in the deep learning toolkit are the correct tools for understanding those shared embeddings, um, or at least for steps of the process. One of the common limitations of this work is that people who are doing grounded language work tend to focus on the specific type of attributes that they're learning about, which might be size or height or color or shape or whether something makes a noise. Um, but they tend to know in advance what category uh, the grounded language is being learned in. And this makes things like featureization easier because you can featureize in a way that's most consistent with the particular traits that you're interested in learning, which works for some kinds of tasks, but it tends to break down when you're dealing with the complexity of real world objects and in particular, when you're dealing with unconstrained human language. So a more principled approach turns out to be to retrieve visual features by using a convolutional neural network that's pre-trained on ImageNet to jointly process all percepts. And in our case, again, that's vision and depth data from a robot sensor. We can then look at the dimensionally reduced version of the final layer that's commonly used as a visual embedding. And this lets us learn terms for both individual objects and for concepts we might not have considered. So for example, we found that a lot of people given our, our data set of objects wanted to talk about what things were made of. They wanted to talk about something like ceramic, something being made of ceramic or aluminum, um, which is not actually a trait that we had considered when we were thinking about what kinds of language people would be using that we would need to ground. But this approach can accommodate that. And once again, this works pretty well. It works well enough to outperform previous work using handcrafted visual features for specific object characteristics. Um, this also used a new data set of descriptions collected for the purpose, which were visually a lot more heterogeneous than some of the grounded language data sets going around right now. So basically, this is a nice, simple way of learning a variety of groundings from multiple kinds of percepts without having to predefine the specific traits or categories to be learned. And that's important um, because there's a huge amount of variety in the language learning problem. There's a lot of variety in the sensory data retrieved, and there's a lot of variety in the language in what people want to say. So, so far, I've been talking about some specific methods that we're using to learn grounded language from a combination of text and mostly visual sensors. But real human language is extremely contextual. When we're understanding language, we take a lot of different factors into account. And maybe more critically, when we talk about, when we envision talking to robots, we really envision talking, we don't envision typing. 
So in the next section of the talk, I'm going to talk about some of the work we're doing on language grounding for multimodal inputs and particularly for speech. So, so far when I say language, um, I've mostly meant language that's been typed out or in a handful of cases has been transcribed. In practice, spoken language is a much more difficult problem. Just to give, I've given some examples of data from our data sets where relatively simple objects or scenes were described either by somebody who had a text box from Mechanical Turk or who was asked to actually speak, describe things in spoken language. And you can see they're very different. Spoken language has a lot of disfluencies. It has a lot of backup and a lot of repair. Uh, it tends to be more wordy. People tend to describe things at more length when they're speaking. And this is just even leaving aside the questions raised by back and forth dialogue. Spoken language is just a much harder problem than dealing with textual input. But when we talk about deploying robots in human spaces, language, spoken language is really the modality that we're envisioning. And unfortunately, automatic speech recognition isn't the answer. Um, not only does it fail often, even in comparatively simple cases, it's often cloud-based, which tends not to be great for robotics. It's also been widely shown to perform less well on different voices, on a variety of voices. And that includes women's voices, anybody who isn't a native speaker of Midwestern American English, anybody outside a fairly narrow age range and so on. So if we don't want to deploy agents that are sort of perpetuating these existing inequities in how our technology performs, we need a better approach. But speech is just another sensor input and it can be handled similarly to the sensor inputs that I've been describing thus far, at least in theory. Given that I've been describing relatively general learning approaches, it should be possible to learn groundings that directly connect speech to other perceptual data without using any intermediate textual representation. And of course, one of the immediate problems that we encountered is there really aren't any data sets designed for this particular problem that have both speech and sensor data that includes depth as well as just still images. Um, ideally, we'd also like to have the kind of textual data as part of that data set that people have been working with so that it's possible to compare results against sort of previous, what would it look like using the textual data that people have that so that we can compare against existing text only approaches. So we set out to collect that data set and our initial data set, which is called gold, the grounded language data set has about 16,000 spoken descriptions and 16,000 typed ones. Um, those are collected independently. So the spoken descriptions are not somebody reading out the typed descriptions. Those were completely independent data collection processes. Uh, the data set also includes automated speech recognition results from running through Google's uh, speech to text ASR engine. And we found those, we found a sampling of those transcriptions to be about 67% accurate. So not bad, but not great. And all of this data was collected using Amazon Mechanical Turk, which of course has its own set of design constraints and difficulties. And the goal here is to demonstrate that all this information helps to take symbols that we've encountered and ground them to new objects in the world, right? Um, to be able to describe some novel object or task that would otherwise have to be programmed in some more traditional way. And if we consider embeddings of this speech using these learned manifold approximations and consider the embeddings of speech to have some distance between them, then we can answer the question of somebody is talking, what are they talking about? Um, by looking for things in the environment whose perceptual embeddings are near or embedded close to symbols that we've already learned using some distance threshold. And doing that, we find that we can achieve about 85% F1 success on this task using a, this kind of traditional object retrieval task. And I want to emphasize here that we're using the learning mechanisms that I already described using featureized speech directly without going through any kind of textual language or textual intermediary. So these sound files can be used as direct inputs to the learning systems that I was describing. And my expectation was that during our initial studies, uh, transcribed speech would do better than spoken speech, just because 
that's what the system was developed on. It was developed on textual inputs. In practice, we found that learning directly from speech outperformed transcribed language that used the same featureizations immediately. And that's not actually, that shouldn't be that surprising because transcriptions are strictly a lossy version of the speech inputs. But I didn't necessarily expect it to work like right out of the gate. So that was one of those nice surprises that you don't get too often. Now, since handling speech is percept, yes, please. So you're saying that the, so you're saying that the uh, input vector here is literally the sound of the waveform? It's featureized. Okay. The featureized waveform. Okay. So yeah, it's going through, this is, um, these lines shown here are actually a variety of different featureizations okay. um, or, and, and transcriptions. So this is wave to vec 2.0, okay. which is a standard featureization for, uh, for speech. So a precursor for um, speech recognition. It can be, or... um, but it turns out it can also be used directly for this. Okay, so you have to, uh, this also takes into account, account uh, um, a time sharing for, for, for no, so. not particularly. Um, this is not this is not a featureization that's sensitive to that. So. Thank you. Sure. Other questions? Does it help in these cases to have uh, the transcription, even if it might not be inaccurate, as an additional input to the system, together with the raw waveform? You know that's. In that's a great question. I have not actually tried that directly. Um, it's possible. My instinct is that it probably wouldn't because this kind of um, manifold alignment based approximation throws away redundant data. I and I suspect the vast majority of the time, because the transcription is a strictly a lossy version of the speech, I suspect it wouldn't help. But that's that's a good question, and it's something we should try. Um, if so, then we could maybe squeeze a little bit more performance out of it. Although, again, um, one of the problems with AR with ASR systems in these kind of robot environments where you've got people who are talking to robots and you want them to respond quickly and so on, is that they are cloud-based and they do tend to be for some of the possible systems fairly high latency. Um, so there would be some downsides, but that's that's still something that should definitely be tried. I noticed that you you're using depth as an additional modality in your experiments. Did yes. you notice that it was uh, it significantly improved over just using RGB alone? Um, it does improve over using RGB alone, and it improves both. Um, it improves the final result, but it also improves the rate of convergence. Um, quite a bit. I, I don't know about significantly. That's, I mean, because we're using cameras that have both vision and depth, so there's no particular reason not to use it. But when we run ablation studies without it, the system does perform worse without that data. And I think if we were using, uh, if we were taking that modality into account uh, in a slightly more sophisticated way, rather than just you know, jamming it into the same inputs as the other visual data, I suspect it would help more. And that's relevant partly because one of the things that the gold data set has that we could not find an existing data set um, for is, you know, more than one sensor modality. And we'd like to add additional sensor modalities like thermal data to it. Uh, because a lot of the data sets that exist for speech are strictly speech associated with individual images. Okay. So since handling speech as percepts is partly desirable so that we can potentially handle differences introduced by speaker variants, in order to more fully understand the nature of the data we're considering, human annotators went through all the speakers in the data set and annotated individual voices with information about those voices. So that included whether they spoke accented English, the level of vocal creak and hoarseness present, and the annotator's perception of the speaker's gender, um, as well as information about the sound files they produced, such as how much microphone distortion was present. 
And if, the, if one of the goals is to understand the communication regardless of the speaker, this information helps provide insight into whether we're doing that effectively. We didn't collect ground truth about the speakers such as age because we really do care about the voices, about the sound files themselves rather than about the speakers. But if we had it to do again, um, that's something we might do differently in the future is, is collect some of this data from end users themselves rather than doing manual labeling as we continue to expand this data set. I think there's a question. Okay. 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 All right. And what we found is that the transcribed data does in fact perform less well for some user characteristics, such as non-native English speakers, but the speech-based model suffered less performance degradation for accented speech. Um, so what this implies is that learning directly from speech has the potential uh, has the potential benefit of generally reducing the performance bias towards specific subpopulations by not necessarily having making some of the strong assumptions that happen if you're going through these ASR models. And we hope a larger data set will make it, you know, more, more obvious what some of these statistical differences are for other groups. So I've been discussing mechanisms for grounded language learning that are very flexible. We can swap in different learning approaches. We can swap in different language models. We can even swap in different modalities to learn from. Um, but that flexibility makes the approaches I've been describing extremely data hungry. And it's already difficult to collect data for human robot, sorry, for human robot interactions. Um, for one thing, you've got all the difficulties associated with running human participant studies. Uh, but you've also got to have a robot that's, you know, running and performing consistently through the however many numbers of trials that you want. You also are limited in the settings for which you can collect data. If you want, for example, to understand speech in a hospital setting, it's very difficult to just grab the robot, haul it to a hospital and start collecting speech from a bunch of people who are working in the hospital. Um, you know, if you want to expand beyond a couple of settings the problems get, get very serious. And that's all been especially true for the last few years as the pandemic makes even like human-human interaction difficult and constrained. So I'm going to talk about some work that's intended to make that whole process more scalable. Simulation to reality or sim to real is the whole area in robotics of learning things in simulation and then applying the learned models to real physical problems. It's difficult to apply in human robot interactions specifically because for it to work, the human, the robot needs a simulated person to learn from or someone in virtual reality. And that's the idea I'm going to talk about using virtual reality settings to accomplish that. Broadly, the goal here is to build a simulation environment where humans and robots can engage in robotically realistic interactions. And a lot of the time in HRI, the goal of simulation is to learn more about the human side of these interactions. Um, for example, by training a person in virtual reality to use a particular robot. But our goal here is actually the, the inverse of that. We want to have a robot that's learning from the interactions using simulated sensor data and real input from people in the VR setting with it. So we're working with this interface where real people can interact with virtual agents using either a cave setting or off the shelf commodity hardware like gaming headsets. This makes it a lot easier for a variety of people to engage remotely. And meanwhile, the agent is receiving simulated perceptual data as in the middle image here, um, along with the person's speech and some of the, the, some of the captured motions. This way, the entire interaction can be not only stored but replayed using things like different models for the robot sensing capabilities uh, as, as, as changes are needed without requiring the humans, without requiring additional human data. 
So what the robot has learned can then be transferred to a real robot in the real world. There are a couple of facilities that make this more feasible. One of them is the photogrammetry rig, which is a facility that lets us collect very high fidelity models of people and robots that are participating in an experiment. Because this is happening inside simulation, we can always replace the avatar of the human that the robot is interacting with with a different one and rerun a participant's trial without a person having to re have, without them having to redo the actions. So we can do things like collect a large number of different avatars for the robot to be interacting with. And as an alternative to a VR headset, it's possible to use immersive cave environments. So this one is a partial cave consisting of a room-sized four by six wall of thin bezel monitors with a real-time tracking system and its own computing cluster. And one of the things that makes this feasible is that people don't need things to be truly photorealistic to engage in realistic interactions. Participants can easily understand the interaction and engage in realistic behavior at a very achievable level of simulation. And the way this simulator is built, it's essentially a combination of unity to do rendering of the environment for both the person and the robot, and a combination of ROS and gazebo for actual robot control. And one of our design goals was to not need to write separate code for the robot in the simulator and in reality. So it's key to note that as far as the robot is concerned, it's receiving sensor data and conducting actions. And no part of the robot system knows or cares whether that's happening in a physical environment or a simulated environment, which is good because the ultimate goal is to be able to go back and forth between those two settings seamlessly. This project has the nice feature that a lot of the work can be iteratively improved from a core of working technology, especially since we can make improvements that are retroactive to data we've, always, we've already collected, which is kind of like this amazing holy grail of human studies, uh, because there's always something where you wish you could go back and change where you put one of the sensors, for example. And in, in this case, we're actually able to do that. Um, we're continuing to work on developing scenarios and improving the simulator itself. And in the longer term, this makes it possible to collect data from a wider range of sources. Since the whole system is set up for remote access, anyone with commodity VR gaming equipment could potentially be a participant. But it's also possible to imagine bringing the whole setup to external settings. So you could imagine bringing you know, a headset and a beefy computer to a school or a library, um, different settings that enable, might, might make it possible for us to move away from these convenience pools of people who are found on college campuses. So broadly, the experiment we're currently running is one in which people are asked to describe a variety of objects in the environment, and then asked to instruct the robot through the process of performing a task with them, here describing a set of objects and then packing a lunch. And when we've collected data from people doing this, now that we're physically able to access the robot again, the next step is to set up approximately the same setup in a physical environment. It doesn't need to be exact and see how well the robot can follow instructions about similar objects in the real world without additional training. And that physical transfer work is currently underway. We've got a robot in the lab that's interacting with physical objects, um, but we don't have like complete results for that yet. Um, then we can iterate on improving the simulation only where it's necessary. And of course, all of this depends heavily on using the learning methods that I described during the first half of the talk. And the fact that we're doing all the simulation in Unity has significant advances, advances, advantages for fast prototyping. It means that we're able to use a variety of sources for scenario development. So here I'm showing a hospital room from the robot's perspective. And this is just a standard Unity asset. So it took about a day to get it set up to run experiments in. And the view on the right is the robot's depth sensor. The view on the left is the robot's visual sensor. But it also makes it easier to do in-house scenario development. So this scenario is actually the main dining hall at my institution with a lot of individual objects that can be interacted with. All the individual food objects, for example, can be loaded on a plate based on instructions. And here the picture on the right is of the actual dining hall. So you can see that the simulation in this case is fairly detailed. Mm -hmm. So Dan Kotashek asks, 
Having moved into a simulated physical task domain, are you interested in the motor origins of language, grounding language specifically in symbols of action? So we have done some grounding languages into action rather than sort of objects or environments. And I'm interested in continuing to do that. There's some really interesting work happening in that space, not just in my lab. Um, but I don't, I don't think that's particularly, I don't think that that's particularly necessarily associated with doing things in the simulated environment. Because we've got a robot that's running Ross, that's an exact copy of a robot that's happening in the physical world, any sort of actions that can be perceived in the simulated environment and that can be conducted by the robot um, should, should be the same between the two settings. Other questions? Um, I think Regina raised her hand. Would she like to speak? Okay, well, maybe we'll come back to it yeah, if so. Back. So another benefit to this approach is there are a lot of other places to draw from. So this is an indoor scenario from AI2 Thor, which is a set of interactive environments from AI2 developed specifically for embodied AI work. And this, this, this data set contains some 120 indoor scenarios and thousands of assets. So this is just a video of us controlling a robot in one of the hospital room settings we're working with. And if you're familiar with Ross, you can see that this is standard. In the bottom, we have the robot sensor inputs and in the top view is from a camera placed in the environment itself. And one of the things I'd like to point out here is that robotics research is expensive and not everyone or every research group can afford to have a setup like this in real life. So one of the things I hope is that when we demonstrate that the sim-based learning can be brought to real environments, that will make this kind of research more accessible to a larger set of people with a lower barrier to entry. So I've talked about a number of concepts here. I've talked about several different mechanisms of learning based on this concept that language and perceptual, they were different kinds of perceptual data can all be treated as projections of some non-observable shared embedding space. Uh, I've talked about some learning methods that draw on that, on that conceptualization. And I've talked about how we can use that conceptualization to extend beyond just textual language into speech-based language and how we can start to address some of the data problems that that induces by using simulation to reality for, for a true human robot interaction setting. Um, but that leaves a lot of, that's, this, this opens a lot of paths for future work. Uh, one of the areas that we're working in right now is to extend the meaning of language learning. To, so right now, natural language grounding in robotics in particular means observable state. And the semantics of groundable language are much richer than that. So for example, if somebody says I'm lost, that's not a declarative statement where the point is for the robot to then know that you're lost, right? Um, there's some, there's some follow-up that's supposed to happen based on that. And the correct response is, where are you trying to go? Um, and that's grounded in an understanding of things like physical location. Um, a lot of people are working on it, but it's still not a, a popular topic in grounded language. Meanwhile, there's a robust conversation happening in the machine learning community about bias and discrimination in learned systems. And part of what we're working on is trying to find ways to collect data that's more broadly representative and learn from that data in broader ways with fewer uh, preconceptions that limit the, the ability of the learned systems or the developed systems to behave similarly across different groups. Um, and in the interest of bringing some of the ideas from those conversations into the HRI and language space. So broadly, learning grounded language is a complex space that has a lot of associated components and draws on a lot of fields. Um, I hope this has given you a bit of an overview of the work that we're doing in this space. Um, obviously, this work depends on a lot of input. This is done by a uh, set of tremendously talented students and collaborators that I'm lucky to have. And I'd be related to take any more questions. Thank you. <laughs>
Thanks for the great talk. Um, so I had a question about the first part. Um, so I was tr uh, trying to understand what are the, so in, in a scene like where you're trying to identify a white mug or something like that. Mm -hmm. um, so what are the uh, competing objects present, right? So, mm -hmm. um, because uh, you said like, you know, the examples that you showed like uh, yellow banana, um, that uh, can be learned from uh, the word embeddings, the distance to other objects, uh, but Things like, so you, in one of the slides, you had an example that the smallest cuff, bring me the smallest cuff, right? So um, that explicitly depends on the other objects present, right? So over there, um, the word embeddings cannot right. necessarily tell you the smallest cuff from the largest cuff. So we don't actually do inter-term inter, inter relationships. Uh, we don't actually handle things like the smallest cup. Um, and in this learning system, smallest would get turned into something like small or small mug would get turned into something like, you know, mug of about this size, which is not the same as smallest, um, but it's how it would be interpreted for this system. And I actually, we actually have a colleague who has been doing some work on this kind of interactive, uh, the interactions and spatial relationships and semantic relationships between objects uh, using a more, using a semantic interpretation, um, a, a semantic parse that's, that's got explicit, uh, explicit operators for that kind of relationship. Um, but it's not reflected yet in the work so that I'm doing. Spatial modifiers also do not exist in the, like, so you uh, don't have examples with a left uh, cup with a left handle? For example. Okay. Yeah. Got it. Yeah. All right, thank you. Uh, so I have a question on uh, the grounded language acquisition work. Um, mm -hmm. Have you thought about how that would be improved potentially in, a, in an embodied setting, in a situated setting where the human is not just describing an image uh, of, of an object, but is actually able to, for example, point to the object, right? And, and you know, there are so many other cues that you could actually use if you're actually physically in the same environment as the robot that's trying to learn. We have, so part of why I'm so, I'm gonna, pointing is kind of a slightly separate case that uh, we've done some work on just on didactic gesture recognition and how that can be brought into the learning system just to, just to understand what objects people are describing when, when you're learning about things from people. But part of why I'm, I'm, I'm very into this, this shared embedding um, conceptualization of the language learning problem is that it is fundamentally multimodal. It is fundamentally able to handle vision and depth and typed data and spoken data and any other modality that you can think of could be implemented in the same kind of learning system without making major architectural changes in theory. This is kind of a, a slightly higher level question. Uh, a lot of what you've described is about communication from the human to the robot mm -hmm. through language. Mm -hmm. Do you think there is a space of possibilities for how the robot itself might, for example, communicate the state of its learning, something that it's confused about to a human that is trying to guide it in the world? Right. So one of the things that we've explored is doing active learning and what active learning mechanisms for the robot to ask for, for example, to seek labels for objects in the environment in order to improve the efficiency of learning. Because people do tend to provide if you just ask people to provide descriptions of a bunch of objects, they tend to do it in an ordering that is not particularly ideal for machine learning. You know, they'll spend a lot of time describing like one object or concept, and then they'll say something like, and this is a lime. It's the same as a lemon, but green. And that's it. Now you're supposed to understand both of those ideas. Um, what we found, and we did a study on a bunch of different active learning approaches for selecting the correct object to selecting the thing that the robot should be seeking information about. And the thing about active learning is um, if you ask the wrong questions, if you use the wrong mechanism for learning, 
then you actually can end up in a situation where the performance is worse than random. And figuring out what the right questions are depends heavily on the environment. So it depends on things like the visual and linguistic complexity of what you're, what you're working on. Uh, and in fact, that, that spawned an entirely separate paper on how do you measure the visual and linguistic complexity of something when you're talking to a robot about it. But we do have these active language, this, these active learning approaches that we do, we do implement for some of our data gathering stuff. Uh, in one of your slides, you had uh, two plots side by side about, um, I think, uh, like a 2D visualization of the embeddings in language and from image. Mm -hmm. uh, were those uh, embedding spaces created independently, like one trained only on language data and only no. on image data? No, it's, it's a visualization of the shared embedding the shared space embedding. that they're both being mapped into using this triplet loss right. manifold alignment approach. Have you looked into uh, how, how that, that changes if you only use language? Because in your, your gold data set, I think you had uh, 16,000 uh, or some, a really large number of uh, language mm -hmm. uh, examples, but the, the total number of images that are RGBD pairs was, I think, fewer? Much smaller, yes. Yeah, uh, so is there, is, is there any sense of how much those, this, this visual modality is impacting this uh, embedding space? Well, so that particular embedding is learned by trying to force language and vision that, that are paired, that occur as part of the same description um, to be close together in the embedding space and trying to force objects that have different description or, or trying to force different descriptions to be distant in the embedding space. So there would have to be a different mechanism for learning the embedding for it to be possible for that to operate over just a single modality. And I think if you, if you went with just trying to embed just the language, um, I think what you'd find is that you, that would that would um, that would bottom out in one of the existing embedding language approaches, and you could probably get something where you've got you know, semantically similar language that's embedded. I mean, you'd end up with something like paragraph vectors. Just a quick question. And that uh, uh, techniques are sort of based on um, being, uh, learning embedding, particularly you know, like contrastive learning. Uh, they have a reputation for being a little bit unstable. It's sort of yes. going to weird places. I'm just wondering yes. if you sort of follow. They do. Um, the actual approach that I, the, the two approaches that I talked about today have proven to be very stable for the problems that we are applying them to. But that's not, I'm not gonna make a stronger claim about, oh, that's not a problem for grounded language or anything. Um, I'm going to say that for the approaches that we're currently working with, that has not been a problem with the data sets that we have. And it is, it is something that we're very aware of and kind of keeping an eye out for. It just hasn't come up yet. That's... Uh, I have a slightly different question. Uh, so you talked about language grounding, which is understanding language, uh, making robots and humans work together. Uh, to do certain tasks with multimodality as the key ingredient. If I wanted to uh, think of, uh, let's say, the driving manual of uh, Pennsylvania, which consists of a bunch of rules that you and I understand that we one day hope robots will understand equally uh, well, uh, we would. These rules are typically quite imprecise. So it is left to the reader's judgment, often, even if it is called the rule book to interpret them and what i'm wondering is what does this how how would you think about taking data of let's say taxi drivers uh, people who drive a lot uh, maybe uh, interpret rules in uh, a special way than us who don't drive that much uh, uh, and codifying 
uh, the driving manual and the real data into some schematic that is precise. How can we make language more precise or rules, sets of rules more precise by watching how people interpret them? Well, I think what you would end up with is something where the sets of rules are um, consistent with the largest body of behaviors that you're perceiving, which isn't necessarily the same as correct. So you, you would probably be able to get something, you might be able, and this is, this is pretty far field, right? So I'm, I'm going from first principles here. Um, but you should be able to get a grounding that's sort of consistent with the most common interpretations of what you're seeing in the data. Um, but whether that's more precise or, there's a difference between more precise and simplified, right? Um, because one of the things about that kind of data is there's a lot of edge cases and there's a lot of sort of, we know how to interpret it given a variety of different settings that you may not see a whole lot of. Um, and I think what you'd end up with is maybe a simplified set of rules or constraints that might or might not actually capture what you're trying to accomplish. Yes, and I, guess, I think the question that I have in mind is exactly the opposite of this. Okay. So, uh, we want to use grounding as a way of making things, of picking in all the corner cases. If you're grounding model, let's call it a big model that says that two things are similar, then it should say, no, 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 these two things are not similar. There are nuances where they are not. So grounding is not, this kind of grounded language learning is not great at edge cases. Um, it's not great at taking in sort of the, the atypical outer edges, um, precisely because it, it does bottom out in this kind of learning where you're, you're depending on a lot of data that has a fairly strong inductive bias. Mm -hmm. And I don't know that I don't know how you would use grounded language learning to address the problem you're describing without just sort of casting a very wide net and potentially ending up with something that doesn't have a meaningful interpretation. Thanks. So I have a question about the symmetrial section. Mm -hmm. um, so in general, I love the symmetrial space, but I worry in terms of the fact that you can't simulate language, mm -hmm. right? And so if you do some sort of symmetrial setup, you need to collect a small amount of language or some amount of language, and then you can replicate situations in the simulator, but the language stays fixed. So how do you avoid any kind of bias in terms of replicating all that language for all the situations? So we're not actually looking at replicating language for different situations synthetically. We're looking at collecting a large amount of language from humans in the environment based on the idea that you can get a lot more language from this simulation setting where you can do it remotely and it can be done by anyone with a virtual reality headset and so on. Um, as compared to if you had to bring a certain number of people into the lab to talk to the robot about the environment and about what they're seeing and about the setting. So the goal is, so if you're making changes to the environment, you might change out, for example, what the robot sees in terms of the avatar or the sensor model that you're using to try to understand the environment as the robots are perceiving it. But we're not talking about replicating the language ac across a very large number of varying scenarios. And that does still limit the amount of data that can be collected, right? Um, what you can say about it is not, this gives us access to just arbitrarily large amounts of data. What you can say about it is it gives us access to more data than and in a wider variety of settings than if we had to bring those people in to talk to the robot in the hospital room. Does that answer the question? Uh, in a follow-up to that, I mean, I had had a question also 
when you were talking about swapping out avatars, mm -hmm. would you run the risk since since you were saying that you could like recreate the same system um, with different visual avatars, like that would be a visual change and not an auditory change. Right. So would you run the risk of, of implying that, you know, people who look different would sound the same? If you're not careful, yes. Um, by swapping out avatar, what I meant is actually uh, getting hold of higher quality avatars with better riggings for the same person. So I didn't, I, I'm sorry, I did not mean to imply that you could then take a hundred people who are different height and, you know, skin color and, and different, you know, change all the things that you can change about an avatar and just pretend that the same language came from each of them, because I think you're right. I think that would be a trap. All right. Um, thank you very much, Cynthia, for the for the great talk and for giving us all a lot of interesting uh, food for thought uh, on the intersections between language and robotics. Uh, thank you to everyone who joined us, both in person as well as remotely. I'd like to remind you all also that uh, these talks are always recorded. They're also put on YouTube only a few hours after. Uh, for next week, we have um, a, a, another uh, very uh, exciting speaker. Uh, Dorsa Sadiq from uh, from Stanford. Uh, so I look forward to joining you all again next week.